Hello, welcome to the RTE Olympics podcast. Mikey Stafford here. I have been joined by Eric Donovan. It's almost midnight back in, in, in over in Paris now, Eric. And um, it was a, a mixed day, a mixed day in the Paris Nord Arena for the Irish. I think it's fair to say. Yeah, Mikey, it was a tough day to be honest, but uh, a glorious day as well for Kelly Harrington and for her family and friends, and her all of her team and her club and everyone back in Portland Row and her wife Mandy. Like you know, I'm delighted for them. I really am. But um, yeah, the night you know Jude Gallagher got the day off to start, and you know I I have a very personal close link to Jude. Um, we've been working together for a long time and I'd real high hopes for him. I just wanted him to go out and prove himself, to really perform, give his best and and to just walk away from this Olympic Games with your head held high, knowing that you gave your best. And he, do, he did that. He did everything that he could have done on the day. Um, his, op- his opponent was exceptional. He was like his, a he was like a rubber ball with fists. He was yeah. He looked, he looked he come up against a, just a very good opponent. But at the same time, I thought maybe the second round was Jude's, and it was five nil again. So look, what do I know about boxing? <laughs> um, so um, but uh, you know, fair Eric. <laughs> yeah, but look, I mean, I, I I'm definitely not screaming robbery or anything like that. Yeah, but yeah. Jude, Jude ran him close. Jude ran him close, and on a different day, we wouldn't know. We could be looking at a different decision, but he can hold his head up high. He has proved himself, and he gave a good account of himself, and that's all he could do. And he's only 22 years of age. He's had a serious um couple of years. And now he just needs to enjoy himself with his family and friends and his girlfriend, Jessica, and just enjoy the rest of the Olympics and can talk about his reset for the future when he when he gets back in a, in a couple of weeks time. But um, the night finished off on a real sour note with Aoife O'Rourke losing. And I really backed Aoife to win a medal out here. I like I like most Irish people. I was so confident she was going to win a medal. She had beat Washick many times. Um. And I just thought she had her number. But before I go on into the fight to analyze it a bit more, I want to put my hands up and say that I actually missed the warning in the first round. So um, I had to ask my wife, at the, the, who is at home, to send me a video of the warning because I said it just, I did not see. It wasn't very clear or apparent to me. And she sent me the video. And again, I could see it clearly in that. But again, it just shows you how quickly the ref did. He just did this. Normally with a warning, they make it very clear and they'll point their finger to uh, more than one judge. But he just put his hand up and just said box. And I just, I, I wasn't, for, I, I just didn't get it. Went over my head and I apologize for that. Um, maybe it's just a long day. Um, it's been it has been a long day. But oh, well, I, I would say, Eric, that the there's people crying foul. There's references to Michael Conlon in Rio, and you know people are upset because he said Aoife was a definite medal hope, and she seems like a very likable boxer, and like people just love the way she fights, and people were very unhappy with how the Polish kind of fighter approached it. But you said it. Uh, the analysts on the TV um said it as well that the scoring of the judges is hard to fault it, but the referee was perhaps a little bit weak. Would you agree? Yeah. And now looking back, you know, retrospect is a great thing, but the referee give did give a warning in round one. And um, what happens at times is the referees don't want to be responsible. And I think I said this to you in our previous podcast, Mikey, they don't want to be responsible for the outcome of a match in an Olympic game. So if they feel that, one person is penalizing more than the other, then they will probably give a warning. And in you know, in the case of this fight, Wojcik got a warning. But after that, I thought she Wojcik clever and credit to her, very clever in a way that she just pulled Aoife into a scrap, made it a terrible, messy affair, and just seemed to t- tore affect her get under her skin and Aoife kind of played into that she was trying to land the big shots but she got a bit she got a bit maybe too emotional in it all and um, what I mean by that is she just kind of she lost her composure and she got into a bit of a scrappy affair with her too she, I still thought that her physicality and her strength would prevail and she would eventually just shake off Wojcik, but Wojcik just kept making it messy. And I think what ha- maybe the referee felt that, okay, there's two people playing this game. 
Mm. So I'm not going to go in again with another. Look, I'm just trying to give an honest mm. view. Maybe I'm not going to go in with another public warning because there's two of them kind of playing this game. Mm. Um, is that boxing though? What Wojcik did, in, in your opinion, is it is it, like you can say it's canny and it's clever and it's you know it won her the fight, but is is it boxing? Because to me, it seemed like she was doing an excessive amount of holding and she was even throwing <laughs> Eva Rourke on a few occasions. It just seemed that she got under her skin all right, but was it legal what she did to get under her skin? She just jumped on her from the start, you know, and she just tried to surprise her. And um, look, I thought, look, after the first round, I thought Aoife would just get into her flow and just really start landing at will and punching out, you know, and, and maybe, maybe win comfortably in the end. Um, but Wojciech just kept being in her face, just kept being a nuisance, but she wasn't really trying to box properly. She was trying to be a spoiler and all that. So look, I suppose the referee maybe bottled it. Maybe bottled it, you know? Mm. Because like I said, they don't want to be, maybe there's that fair, they don't want to be responsible for the outcome, that they prefer the judges to deal with it. But in, when you're looking at the judging and the scoring of it, it was very, you know, 50-50, punches going in. You know, I couldn't really fault that. Um, I suppose the only kind of saving grace that that probably Aoife could have hoped for is if the referee went and gave another warning. And prob- and I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people uh, w- probably wouldn't have complained about that. But I'm just trying to say that she'd done it in such a way that brought that kind of dragged Aoife into the into the game too, into that kind of you know scrappy, messy, um swinging, grappling. It was rough. It was really rough. It was a hard fight to watch. It was a hard fight to score, a hard fight kind of really to to look at. And my heart goes out to Aoife. It really does because this is all over so quick. Mm-hmm. I've been in fights like this before where you just feel like, oh you're you're like I heard I heard Aoife's interview she didn't disappoint like look I know she's going to be disappointed but she didn't let anybody down you know Absolutely she didn't let not. anybody I know the expectations she had on her shoulders she's a winner she's a three time European champion she was coming out here and she wanted to win medals and we all believed that she was going to win medals but look it's easy for all of us to say on the outside and say this is how it should have been done or that's how it should have been done but she's a professional athlete she knows herself that she didn't perform okay that was out of 10 that was like probably a four. Mm. She didn't perform. She knows that. And Wojcik was responsible for making that happen as well. But as a three-time European champion who has only been defeated once since the last Olympic Games, you have to be able to deal with this stuff. Yeah, You just have to be able to deal with it. This is, you know, elite level fighter, European champion, possible Olympic medalist. You have to be able to deal with the controversy. And I know that you need the judges and the referees and the responsible. You know you need them to do their job too. So it's just hard. Look, it's heartbreaking. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, and I know that there's a lot of people who are really upset. And rightly so. Look, I was really hoping that Aoife was going to bring home a medal. I really was. We're all upset. Everybody's upset. I'm upset. I'm gutted for her. Mm. But nobody's more upset than her. Let me yeah. tell you that. Nobody's more upset than Aoife Rowe. Yeah. And all I will say is this. In the aftermath of it all, I have to, like, when things cool down, she'll regroup. She's a professional athlete. She's still well capable of going to another Olympic Games and winning a medal. So oh, I don't absolutely. doubt that for one second. Absolutely. Well, look, if Wojcik showed us one way to win a boxing match. I think Kelly Harrington showed us the complete other end of the spectrum in her win uh, over Angie Valdez of Colombia. It was it was imperious. To me, it just seemed like, like she just did what she wanted. And then in the third round to me, it just looked like she kind of, she kind of just wasn't showboating, but she kind of, she seemed to be having fun in the third round and expressing herself a bit. And if you can do that when there's a bronze medal on the line, it it speaks to a, a high level of confidence about your own abilities, I think. It's just, it's incredible. It really is. And I said it on the comms that we are watching one of Ireland's greatest ever amateur fighters, you know, really. One of the world's best. What she does is just 
entertaining. It's it's skillful. It's a joy to watch. And we're going to now see a repeat of the Tokyo 2020 final in the Paris Olympic Games semi-final. Will it be repeat? Will it be revenge? We are in for some treat. Yeah, yeah, that is the Brazilian. She won her fight uh, convincingly as well, 5 nil. So you've got two, two boxers coming in now who are obviously in good form. And that's Saturday night. That's uh, It's not Roland Garros. Yeah. It's it's going to be in the Parry Nord, but it's going to be a, a hell of a fight to look forward to. Uh, br- briefly then, there just t- tomorrow we have two boxers. It's amazing to think that poor Dana Morehouse still hasn't had a chance to fight, but yeah. she's in against a, a French opponent tomorrow, which yeah. you know hometown make you you know you'd have your, you'd have your worries. And then Jack Marley is out in in his own quarter final. Uh, briefly, how do you think they should go? Yeah, look, I I I hope Dana Morehouse can. She's a different fighter than when she lost to her opponent, her French opponent last year in the quarterfinal of the European uh, Games in the Olympic qualifiers. She lost on a split decision, but she was coming back from an injury that time. She had a really bad injury with her foot, and now over the last year, she's had a good lot of high performance development, surrounded by professional coaches, support staff, and she's really learned so much she's had high level training camps high level sparring and i think she, i was speaking to her the other day she's very very confident and she did say it to me i'm a different fighter than i was last year so that's good she has that quite confidence within her uh jack marley is up against a very difficult opponent mm. but you know what he has the ability if he can put in a career best performance to overturn potalia Taliev is a serious operator, Asian Games gold medalist, 25 years of age. And Asia is a very strong continent. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, you just think of really strong, strong boxing nations. Yeah, all those are stands. They're, they're all Yeah, good. you know, yeah, I can't stand them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, like, look, it's but, but what I liked about Jack's performance the last time as well against his Polish opponent, even though he beat him before, he just came out with real gusto. And you can tell he's up for it. Like, he's going, he's going for it. And but Taliev lost or won in his preliminary round against, uh, actually in his last 16 round against Cash Philly from Georgia. And the Georgian ran him so close. It was the closest of margins what Ali have won in. So I hope that the team will be looking at the video analysis of that and just showing Jack what uh, Botaliev doesn't like. He likes when you're standing off him and he picks you off. He loves it. Nice, easy uh, easy type of boxing where he where things are going the way he wants them to go. But if you put if you jump on him, put pressure on him, let the shots go, high volume work, high volume punching, and um, then he will not like it at all. So I expect should put Wojcik in the ring with him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I expect that kind of performance from Jack, and um, I'd love to see him get over the line. So um, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, please God, now fingers crossed because we need um. We need a road degree. We need a little pick-me-up, yeah. Well, yeah. along with the boxing tomorrow, we've got Noel Hendrick in the Canoe Slalom semis. Uh, we were playing a hockey match against Argentina. Um, Robert Dixon and Sean Wadilov could win a medal, very possibly, in sailing. Philip Doyle and Daryl Lynch are going in the final of uh, of their men's double skulls rowing as well. And the golf gets underway. And earlier today, I spoke to Gary Moore and ahead of Roy McIlroy and Shane Lowry's first rounds. <laughs> Gary Morin has joined me to look ahead to the men's golf tournament, which starts tomorrow morning, if you're listening to this on Wednesday, or this morning, if you're listening on Thursday, at uh, La Nationale. Gary, you were there today for the last day of practice. Um, paint, a, paint a picture for us. Uh, the picture, if anyone remembers, the 2018 Ryder Cup is of a slightly softer Golf Nacional. The rough is not quite so brutal. That was set up very particularly to suit the European team against the USA. It's still a very fair course. Tommy Fleetwood says it's one of the best and fairest courses they play. It does require a lot of accuracy. Uh, but from Fleetwood's point of view, and he's a fairly... Um, good thinker on the game it's a course where the further you stray off the fairway the worse the trouble is and you might say well that's always the case but sometimes it's very heavy thick rough and if you go beyond the rough the thickest of the rough would then maybe get an easier life sometimes that happens at an open championship for example where you, you might go over the really heavy stuff and end up in a good place but it's fairly graduated and for quite a long distance so it's very fair does require straight hitting and um, I think that 
good ball, good straight ball strikers, Scotty Sheffer or anybody, may mm-hmm. well prosper. Okay. Um, looking at a couple of previews this morning, Scheffler is mentioned as I think he's the favorite, as he is the favorite for every golf tournament he enters at the moment for good reason. He he's winning a lot of them. A couple of things. One, his putter seem to desert him a little bit at the open. And secondly, uh, he's been described as being hoofing around art galleries in Paris on a family holiday, which seems to be a theme. Shane Lowry went home to Ireland for the All-Ireland final. Um, Roy McIlroy played St. Andrews. And um, the Open champions, Andrew Chauffle, went to Portugal on holiday. Golfers are allowed a break, but some people are asking, are they preparing for this the way they would, say, for one of the four majors? And whether you maybe should discount someone like Scheffler, who's maybe viewing this as almost a mid-season break before the FedEx Cup? Uh, I think that's stretching it slightly. I mean, they, they've had a very fairly packed schedule, I would say, most of these top players. It's not like they're going to suddenly lose their game. Uh, Xander Schaufle and Colin Morikawa went down to Portugal. They played some golf, I think. Shane Lowry and Rory McIlroy were also in Portugal. They didn't play golf because I think Rory's only played since the Open that round in St. Andrews, plus practice yesterday and practice today here at Golf Nacional. Shane, uh, they played the back nine today, Rory and Shane together. Um, Xander, or Scotty Scheffler, yes, he was, he, he couldn't believe how little of the Louvre he managed to see in the several hours that he spent there with his wife and yeah, I think child as well. Place. It's very young, maybe it's a big place. He couldn't get over the size of the paintings. But um, they're all, look, they're all gunning to win, of course. Uh, they're all competitive. They're not taking it, maybe you say, like a major. But I mean, some of them come in late for a major for one reason or another. They've set their schedules. They can't go out all the time. They also got to stay fresh and it's a decent field. I mean, you've got Scott. Uh, there's the the big missing person is Bryson DeChambeau, and he's not high enough of high enough up in the world ranking, and that's largely, of course, because he plays in Live. Even though he's won a major this year, he's still not high enough in the ranking because America four players in the top sixteen, which guarantees four American players get in. And there's Scotty Schiffer, and there's Xander Schauffele, and there's Colin Morikawa. And I can't immediately think of who the fourth American player is. Oh, yeah, I do. Wyndham Clark. Uh, so they have a strong hand The and there's a strong field. Yeah, you're, you're right to say that largely for some of them, they've taken a bit of a mid-season break. They're going to be going back soon to play several, Fed, ideally for them, several FedEx Cup events. And you just can't do it all the time. And, and a break might be good for them. Yeah. So how do you rate the Irish chances then, Gary? Obviously, Shane Lowry was showed a lot of good form at the Open, admittedly playing on the kind of golf courses which people say suit him best, but that's not to say he can't win around the Parkland course where straight hitting is preferred. And Rory McIlroy, who, um, speaking to our colleague Darren Frehley yesterday, you know, he'd love, he'd, love, he'd love an Olympic medal because it might stop people annoying him about majors for five minutes, but I don't think even Rory McIlroy puts it up there in the same level as a fifth major. But that's... This is a golf course he knows well and has played well on in the past. So would you rate Ireland as medal contenders? Well, yeah, it's, it, uh, Ireland are the two Irish individuals, both mm. have possibilities of medals for sure. Um, Larry hasn't played here bar the Ryder Cup for quite a while, but in 2010, he was fourth in the French Open. 2016, he was third. Back in his debut season, he missed the cut in the French Open. That was 2008. But... Uh, and Shane Larry wasn't on the Ryder Cup team and doesn't have a, a, in, in his French, which I'm not sure how many French Opens he's played. He's never had a really high finish in it. But yeah, in a field of 60 and the level that they're playing at, they have chances. But I always think that almost without exception, trying to actually pick your winner of a golf tournament, unlike, say, a tennis tournament, is um, just a, a mad notion because so many of them can win and it's, it's really hard to pick the winner but I do agree that Scotty Shepherd does merit being the favourite A, all the wins he's had this year he's the world number one he is confident I think that he's going to do well he's talked a good game so that it's hard to pick anyone ahead of him but at the same time he's, he's less than 50-50 to win it for sure, Rory McIlroy and Shane Larry have chances of winning a medal. Yeah. Uh, and just to clarify for people, because a lot of people who listen to this podcast are general sports fans. Golf might be their thing. This is not a team event. They're not playing together. They're playing as individuals. And it is played in stroke play, which for people is you play four rounds of 18 holes. 
whoever has the lowest score at the end wins. And if there's a tie, you have a, a tie break, which is called a playoff where you play and you keep playing holes until somebody has a better score than the other. It's the same as the golf we see every week on the PGA Tour, basically, Gary, isn't it? It's the same as the golf that we see in all the majors on the PGA Tour and the vast majority of your, well, almost every DP World Tour event. It's a it's a pity in one way because Shane Larry and Rory McIlroy had a fabulous win in a team event called the Zurich Classic about two months ago, maybe nearly three months ago at this stage. And so there was a team element in that, although they're they're still golfing. But well, depends on the different days. They have a slightly different format. And I spoke actually to Doug Ferguson of Associated Press, who'd be a frequent contributor on radio RTE Radio Sport mm. uh, today, and he was saying. Yeah, absolutely is the right thing to do is to play it in the regular format. Yes, if you want to introduce a team element as well, okay, that, that's a consideration. But he says, all oh, this kind of nonsense about looking for something exciting. Golf is a 72-hole event in most cases, certainly most tournaments at the highest level. Obviously, live tournaments are 54 holes, and he thinks it should be that way. He does say that plans are quite advanced in for the, for LA to have the men's tournament followed by a weekend of a team event, men and women, and then the women's tournament in the second week of LA. So that's yet to be confirmed by the IOC. So you could bring in a team element there and that would be interesting and a little bit different to make it stand out as well. But mm. yes, it is the regular type of golf tournament that's going to decide the gold, silver and bronze here in Paris. Okay, the fact that there's conversations about it, Gary, and like sports come in and out of the Olympics, you know, regularly. You know, there's a lot of people who are watching break the well, the breaking. I don't think it started yet. At least I haven't seen any of it. You know, you've got BMX riding, you've got skateboarding. These are sports that are fairly new to the Olympics, and most people maybe. Maybe some people roll their eyes. Maybe some people say that's great. They're sports that kids are interested in. When golf came back in for Rio, there was a pretty, you know, in some quarters, violent reaction to it. I think people kind of saying golf doesn't belong in the Olympics. And to a point, I could agree. I could see the argument because I think there is some merit in the argument that if, if, if a gold medal in a sport isn't the absolute pinnacle of achievement in that sport, maybe it shouldn't be an Olympic sport. And there's no question that golf a gold medal is the penny. Like there's no way that Justin Rose's gold medal in the Olympics means more to him than his major title. There's no way it does. No one can say, no one can tell me it does. Do you, do you prescribe that logic? Cause as well as being a golf journalist with RTE, you are also an Olympics veteran and a, ver- a fount of knowledge on athletics and various Olympic sports. So you could, ha- could be said to have a foot in both camps here, Gary. Yeah. Well, you're 100% right in what you say. I was at Tommy Fleetwood's press conference today. We read the comments of Rory McIlroy. From, I wasn't at his press conference yesterday, uh, but widespread, yes, the majors, the four golf majors are certainly more des- a more desired victory for all of these players than the Olympic medal. Perhaps the French guys who are here might say, oh, it'll be just as good as winning a major, but that is the exception. And there's no argument about that and they all have mixed feelings in fact what what um i think was what rory said or what, what i think what rory said was you know if we got to the stage where it wasn't being asked then we'd really know that golf had was settled into the was properly settled into the olympics and there is the question yes if it's not the biggest thing then why should golf be in the olympics and maybe golf was brought into the olympics that the conversation started around 2007 2008 before it was in in 2016 because at the time tiger woods was the biggest sports star in the world quite possibly across all sports and well the olympics might have wanted tiger woods maybe that was part of the reason so Maybe if golf stays in the Olympics for several more cycles, then it'll become a bigger deal. But yeah, that's what you've said is is really correct. It's something that the players here certainly want, but it's not going to be, none of them are really going to, except maybe the French are going to rank it as big as a major. Okay. Well, that kind of, it it kind of chimes a little bit, I think, with, because golf did used to be, you know, more than a century ago, it was one of the original or earliest mm. um, sports in the as in the Olympics and in Paris in 1900 as my Olympic fact for today, um, it was won by an American called Charles Sands. Uh, that was the first ever gold medal in men's golf. He won by one stroke from Britain's Walter Rutherford. Uh, the interesting about Sands was he also competed in tennis at the Paris Games, but he went out in the first round there. But a multi sportsman. But 
perhaps not helping golf's reputation at the time, or maybe now with people looking back, the man who came eighth in the uh, Olympic golf tournament in 1900 was a man called Albert Lambert. And he was so wealthy, he was the primary financial supporter of Charles Lindbergh's 1927 transatlantic flight. So, you know, golf's come a long way. It is now a very, you know, it's a very egalitarian sport. You know, it's played all over the world by people of, from every socioeconomic background, but it wasn't always the case, Gary. It did have a bit of a rep back in 1900, I'd say. Yeah. I'd say so, yeah, back <laughs> in the days of the uh, wealthy amateur players who possibly, um, well, would have done, well, who, who, well, they wouldn't have dominated, I don't think, but yeah, there was, there were, there were, there were certainly a wealthy amateur set who were competitive at world level. If there was such a thing as a world, worldwide golf game, that's it. There were probably, well, there wasn't really. I mean, I can remember going back 1970s, 1980s, when the, we call it, can we say, the England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, those teams would do really, really well at, say, European amateur championship level. And the notion that a Norway or a Sweden or a Germany or an Italy, like if you were drawn against one of those in a European match play, it was like great stuff. We're, we're, we're through, we'd be through to the quarters tomorrow, but it's not like that anymore. Like it's become a way more worldwide sport and, you just need to look at the, at the various tours as to how many countries it's played in now. So it's certainly a very, very different from over a century ago in terms of global global appeal, that's for sure. Absolutely. Well, look, that's over the next four days. Now you can keep track of Shane Lowry and Roy McIlroy and how they go at Le Golf National. Um, that's RTE2 Television, um, RTE Radio 1. You'll hear Gary's dulcet tones and the RT website where we'll be keeping you abreast of that with our live blogs, uh, digital highlights, reports, and everything else. So uh, thanks for tuning in tonight, everybody, or this morning, and uh, I'll be back tomorrow, and hopefully we might be chatting to Gary later on in the week about the golf. Thanks very much, Gary. See you all again soon.